All right, let's get into atomic transfers and what this is all about. They all must succeed or all fail. Very analogous to a SQL database. Anybody got SQL database experience out there? Tie together a lot of transactions in one big one. If, they, if any of those fails, rolls back the way it looked beforehand. Same thing here. And this really is very nice because think about it. Person A sends 50 algos to person B. Person B is going to return a concert ticket to person A. This has always been the problem with trying to buy tickets like on Craigslist, right? You don't trust the person that you're doing the transaction with. And many people have gotten burned because of that. So it's trustless. This is beautiful. I can do these transactions with somebody I don't know, and I can be guaranteed exchange of goods. And you can do up to 16 of these in, in one spell swoop. So if person A does not send the required amount to person B of 50 algos, they only send them 25, all bets are off. On the other hand, if person D does not send the ticket back, you can say within a certain amount of time or whatever, then everything's null and void. I get my money back. You're guaranteed. It never actually goes to the person B until the transaction is complete. But you know what the best thing is? This is the secret sauce. This combine, you can combine with other Algorand technology. You can combine using this with assets. You can combine this with smart contracts. And now you can start architecting solutions that use atomic transfers as part of the glue that ties all these different parts together. So what are some examples of atomic transfers? You got simplified expedited settlement, You've got circular trades, distributed payments are all in the mix, group payments, combining with the Algorand ASA and smart contracts. So a lot of good uh, examples there. <clears throat> so let's talk about smart contracts next. So we have a transaction execution approval language or TEAL, which is assembly and runs right on the blockchain. You might be saying, gee, why assembler, Russ? Come on. <laughs> you know, I've been there and done that. Remember the lean and mean thing we we're talking about? It doesn't get leaner and meaner than assembly language, right? On the blockchain. And the VMs to do interpreters and compiles and all that stuff, those are very bulky and very, very time consuming. But we've got all their solutions, right? For those that really don't want to get down to the assembly language level. It's not too bad, by the way. Once you get in there, you get the flow of things and how it works. But where there is, for example, all the Python devs out there, there's a Python-enabled compiler or PyTeal. Uh, you got two types of smart contracts. You got uh, stateless and stateful. So stateless returns true or false. Returns true, it signs it, and boom, you got spending going on. Stateful provides the ability to store state on the blockchain globally for everyone to utilize or local storage at the account level. So these are combinable with other Algorand technologies. Everything's combinable basically here, right? Atomic transfers, assets, and you can actually combine stateless and stateful contracts together. So Algorand stateless smart contracts, basically you've got two types here. You got a logic account and a signature, delegated authority. These are very similar. Except for the logic account, simply returns true or false. And these are good for escrow style accounts, split payments, hash time lock contracts. But the logic signature, in addition to returning true, it also must be signed by a delegated authority. So there's one extra layer of protection there. And this is great for recurring payments. And I'll show you that uh, today in the code as well. So when you are doing stateful smart contracts, just like we had the like life cycle with assets where you can create the asset, you can opt in, you can transact, you can manage it. Same type of analogous scenario here for stateful smart contract life cycle. And you create it, you get yourself an application ID, not an address. And you opt in, you get to participate with the local storage. Also, the creator can opt in as well, and the local storage would be on the creator's uh, account. You have a no-op, which is calling the app to run. You can update the application as well as delete the application. You can close out the application. Uh, TL logic must be true to do that. And then clear state, uh, the difference between that and close out, it will always clear no matter what. 
talk about accounts. <clears throat> so you have a standard account, multi-signature account, and a logic account, or no, <clears throat> logic sig. Well, a standard account has a private and public key and belongs to, say, an individual. A multi-sig account would have several uh, possible members to it. And this is analogous to like when you bring a check to the bank, some checks got to be signed by two people in order to cash it. So the threshold is two. And you can have, say, 10 in a multi-sig, for example. And you could set the threshold to two or three, let's say three. Or then three out of the 10 must sign off on it. And up only at that point would you be able to do a transaction from that multi-sig account. Logic account is a smart contract that returns true and signs it and it returns false, it doesn't. That brings us to rekeying and a deeper discussion on public key versus a private key. A public key, you want everybody to know that because that's how you're going to get money. <laughs> that's how you get do re me assets. You want to say, people want to say, okay, send me, send me some money. Here's my public key. Boom. Just like I did a transaction in algo signing. When I pasted it in that account, that was a public key. Whereas a private key, on the other hand, is used to do the spending. That's the one that spends money. That's the one you don't want anyone to have because you don't want them spending your money. So what Rekeying facilitates, and no other blockchain has this, by the way, it easily facilitates growth. So if you have a single account, which on the left with a pair of orange and green keys there, and let's say your organization grows and you get a board of directors, now you want to have a multi-sig account do the, the, the spending and or maybe you got some new logic rules and business rules that you need to apply to it now you actually want to use a multi-sig account perhaps to do that well up until this point there was very difficult to do this you actually had to create a brand new account and go through it and that's very cumbersome and time consuming so you notice what's on the upper right you have this is a fields in the transaction you can see there's an authorized address for this account that begins with L42 to authorize NFF to go ahead and sign it. So this guy's really got the spending key now and he could uh, sign it uh, right there with that NFF account. That's all there is to it. Very simple in, in nature and it really uh, works very nicely for Rekeying. We do have an Algorand wallet. That's the easiest way to work with assets. There are, it's a developer mode too, where you can uh, toggle to over to testnet. So you can use a testing right out of your wallet. Uh, you can rekey right to the ledger. It has uh, Nano X Bluetooth ledger support and then asset support as well. So it's a pretty cool wallet. Smart contract value, uh, the finance industry, many applications here, including trade finance, clearing and settlement, financial data recording, as well as digital identity. So escrow, for DeFi, payments, credit, and lending, as well as stable coins, which we talked about already. So what about reporting on the data that's in the blockchain? You got millions of blocks out there. So if you were to do a query against the native blockchain, which was the only way to do it initially, it was pretty time consuming, right? To traverse all those blocks to find whatever you're looking for. So Algo D is a, a daemon, one of our three daemons. There's a KMD, which is another one, which is for an online wallet. And also Indexer is a daemon too. And what this does is it offloads this data into a PostgreSQL database, which is indexed. And you can do queries very quickly on it. So this is the solution, right? And many of the SDKs have the ability to utilize Indexer as an endpoint in the SDKs. The four SDKs on top are the ones that Algorand supports, Go, Java, JavaScript, and Python. And then you have, this is all with V2, they call it, for version two of our rollout on this particular feature a few months back. So how do you build uh, an index or how do you use it? Well, you can build your own, and there's a link uh, there to build your own. It could be very large. It could be 200 gig. And it also uses a service. There's another way to do it. So Pure Stake and Algo Explorer, like I mentioned, have stand-up instances already available. The easiest way to access this is through Sandbox, which is a tool I'm going to show in a little bit as well. But when you bring this up by, by default, the, the, it's a private network. 
which is like a personal network on your own to do testing with and it includes an indexer index by default. That's because it starts at the Genesis block <laughs> and goes from there and it indexes as it goes right from the beginning. So really pretty brilliant concept by our engineering team. So let's get into uh, kind of an architectural diagram a little bit, combining some of the layer one features for the voting example we had talked about. So you got a voting commission and you got a voting token. Now these are all gonna be atomically grouped. So this all has to work or none of it works, right? And so you vote for candidate A and that might go through some validation with a smart contract. If everything is validated and everything's legit, then it'll go ahead and increment the candidate A total to a global state on the blockchain. Boom. That's it. Now you got it readily available. And this is how you'd go about doing something like that. Another example is crowdfunding. For those folks that are unfamiliar with that, you've got a great idea. And you want to get folks to invest. So you say, okay, I want to invest. I want to raise X amount of dollars. If I don't uh, raise X amount of dollars, then uh, you all get your money back and no product for the money because uh, all bets are off. So we've got a crowdfunding escrow account set up right, with all the monies that are being collected. The payment from escrow one to user one, now these are all atomically grouped. Everything looks good, but then the start, you might have a staple smart contract then saying, okay, yeah, we've compared this to, you know, what we have uh, as a target that we wanna do it. So this is a go, you know, we're full go here. So we can go ahead and start issuing products to these folks and I can start using the funds for my invention. So. That's the, the scenario there. So again, the way you, you orchestrate all of this is through atomic transactions. 